हेलो एवरी वन गुड मॉर्निंग माई नेम इज़ हर्षा निखर एंड वेलकम टू बी साइड्स लास वेगस दिस टॉक इज़ बीन प्रजेंटेड बाई जेसन ग्रेस एंड एडम ब्रैडबेरी ऑन एनिमी विद इन लेवरेजिंग पर्पल टीम्स फॉर एडवांस थ्रेड डिटेक्शन एंड प्रिवेंशन अ फ्यू अनाउंसमेंट्स बिफोर वी बिगिन वी वुड लाइक टू थैंक आर स्पॉन्सर स्पेशली आर डायमंड स्पॉन्सर डोबी एंड आर गोल्ड स्पॉन्सर प्रिज्मा क्लाउड ब्लू कैट एंड टेयोटा it's with their support along with other sponsors donors and volunteers that makes this event possible these talks are being streamed live and as a courtesy to our speakers and audience we would like you to make sure that your cell phones are on silent if you have any question please use the audience microphone so that you do can hear you and uh, with that let's get started and welcome our speakers hey hey Besides, how the hell y'all doing? Excellent. Y'all are here for it. We're here for it. Let's get it, huh? So, my name is Jason. Hello. Uh, I formed and co-lead the Purple Team at Meta with Cedric Owens, that phenomenal human being right there. Uh, the team was officially established back in January of 2022, uh, and uh, before I got into tech, I used to be a touring death metal musician. That was a lot of fun. Doesn't pay well. Uh, and uh, my tech career has focused on pen testing, red teaming, DevOps, and tool development. Uh, I also have several years under my belt as a systems administrator, so I'm old. And um, this isn't the first team I built. Uh, I actually created the corporate red team at Sandia National Labs, which I was able to grow to a size of about seven hackers before I moved on back in 2019. Uh, I was in a black hat class yesterday, and uh, uh, some of the folks that uh, are now on the team were there, so it's still going well. They have uh, stickers, so I have, a, I have one of the stickers from the team, which is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, feel good about that, buddy. Hey everyone, I'm Adam. I'm a tech lead for threat intelligence at Meta. Uh, my background's significantly less interesting than Jason's. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity for about 11 years. Um, I did the first five years of my career working in security operation centers in the UK. I apologize for the accent in advance. Uh, after that, I kind of got involved in threat intelligence after trying to broker information between clients of the MSSB that I was working for and joined a Dutch intelligence company for two years, went all over the world with them, helping government agencies and large corporations build intelligence capabilities. Then 2019, I jumped to Meta um, and joined their team tracking financially motivated threat actors. So um, we've got a hell of a lot to cover today and not a lot of time to do it. So we're gonna to touch on how purple teaming and threat intelligence is set up at Meta. We're gonna introduce TTP Forge, which is the tool we're like releasing open source as part of this talk that helps teams test t like tactics, techniques, and procedures at scale. We'll delve into how Purple Team, Threat Intelligence, and TTP Forge fit in with the wider security teams um, and delve into some of our both shared and unique pain points. But then the meat of this talk is going to be on how we use all of that together to respond to sudden changes in threat landscape. And we'll have some demos to show how that looks like under the hood at the end. So what do we mean by sudden changes in threat landscape? And the stuff on the screen happened in summer of 2022, when a group that's tracked as scattered spider or octopus, depending on where you buy your intelligence from, um, started like causing major headaches for large tech companies. And overnight, leadership wanted to know who are this group, what are they capable of, um, have they targeted us, um, have they been successful and we've, we've missed it? And they wanted to know answers to that now because companies within our sector were being popped and it was in the news like overnight. So like as an Intel nerd, I'm often expected to like peer into a crystal ball and predict the future with 100% confidence. But despite all the resourcing you can throw at it, like that's still not a feasible objective. We still get caught by surprise. New actor groups come out overnight that like we, can, we learn about from incident response teams embedded in different companies. Or like we learn about them from the news articles and have to build some kind of response. The same goes for when vulnerabilities are announced or proof of concept exploits get released where there's like no existing patch for them. And like the world has to scramble to, to work out what the response to that looks like. And I know that's super topical for this conference. So like a lot of talks yesterday and today are about the ethics of responsible disclosure. So what we hope this talk does is lifts the curtain on what it looks like for security teams to be on the other side of that and the work that has to go into place when something like that happens. So backing up a little bit, threat intelligence at Meta. Um, first and foremost, like there are many intelligence teams at Meta. There's awesome people doing amazing work in everything from anti-scraping, in election integrity, influence ops. But the team I'm embedded with is within our incident response function. So we track adversaries that target our employees, our endpoints, and our infrastructure. 
And day to day, we sit side by side with our incident responders, our detection engineers, and our threat hunters. So by virtue of that, we have a huge tactical and operational focus. We don't do too much on the strategic side. Where our specialties lie is in turning intelligence research and tradecraft into applied security changes in the shortest time possible. All right, let's talk about purple, huh? So um, as I'm sure most of you in this room are well aware, dedicated purple teams are a fairly nascent concept in the security space. Um, we're seeing a lot more in the way of red teams that will run purple team engagements, but there's just not that many dedicated purple teams. And all that is to say, <clears throat> There we go, we're not uh, feedbacking anymore. There isn't much of a golden standard at this point, and we're aiming to provide information as part of the general conversation uh, around that topic. And so the first iteration of Purple Teaming and Meta was technically done by Chris Gates, a, a Carnal Owned, shout out to that dude. Uh, while he worked here from 2014 through 2015, um, although this looked significantly different from what we think about when we do Purple Teaming today. So the purple team of today is built as an internal consultancy. So we have customers, deadlines, and stakeholders across the entire company uh, that rely on our deliverables. And taking this approach really helps us to maintain a certain quality and consistency for our outputs, uh, which is really important when you have a variety of customers in different organizations across the world doing dramatically different work. <clears throat> and uh, we spent time right out the gate creating engagement offerings or a menu, if you will, of the various things that we can do that accommodate a wide variety of needs. Uh, in turn, this allows us to work with a lot of different teams and uh, keeps the work fun. So for one engagement, we could be doing something around web, and then the next one could be around infra or mobile or VR. So um, I don't like just doing one thing, and uh, this really checks that box for me. Uh, so, if you are more interested in the program side of that, Cedric Owens and I gave a talk at SANS Pentest Hackfest back in November, uh, covering how the team is structured and functions, so if you want to learn more about that, go check out that talk. And above all, a key principle on Purple Team is to align pragmatism with enjoyment. And so what we mean by this is if you have a endpoint detection and response system that isn't detecting basic TTPs, you should not be sitting there trying to develop a sophisticated bypass. Let's, let's learn to walk before we can run, yeah? And at the end of the day, the effectiveness of creating useful adversary simulations depends largely on their realistic nature. Speaking of TTPs, I want to introduce you all to the TTP Forge, which I am absolutely jazzed to finally be putting out. So this is our homegrown tool for purple teaming at Meta. Um, this tool is going out live a bit after the talk as free and open source software. So I really hope you all get the chance to check it out, see what you think. The primary goal of the TTP Forge is to simplify the process for engineers with diverse backgrounds to test and build detections and preventions. Uh, and we're able to accomplish this by simulating malicious activities uh, using building blocks described with YAML. You can think of it as Legos, effectively, you can stack. And we use this to automate and execute TTPs. Uh, to give you a sense for how the TTPs look, uh, this particular image here is uh, gonna be a part of our, the demos a bit later, um, but it's part of a TTP that steals secrets from the AWS Secrets Manager. Uh, and as mentioned by Adam, we're gonna be doing some demos towards the end of the talk, so stay tuned, yeah? So like every com large company, security doesn't happen in isolation. There's a lot of teams that plug into threat intelligence and purple team. But while putting this deck together, it's like palpable that we're a security rich company. And we can appreciate that not all companies are in that position. A lot of the teams that we plug into may exist in a single person or may in worst case exist in less than a single person. And that's been one of mine and Jason's drivers for releasing TTP Forge is to put the research of a large function like ours into the hands of the community. So if you're on your own facing this or you're a part of a small team, you can still leverage the same research and tradecraft that we're using. So first up in teams that we plug into is incident response, and that's everything from like our tier one to tier three responders. They plug into threat intelligence to get low latency access to intelligence about the groups they're facing in the queues. And we've done a lot of work to embed intelligence directly into the tooling they use so it's there and readily apparent. But if it's not and they're encountering something brand new, they can press one button and tag threat intelligence in to do rapid research to fill in the blanks for them to help them understand what they're dealing with, what the next steps are, what this actor's motivations is, and ultimately how to rip it out of our environment if we detect it. 
Where it plugs into Purple Team and TTP Forge specifically is they have a high need for low latency, or, sorry, low false positive rate detections. If threat intelligence is pushing to land a new detection in response to some threat which we're tracking, but it ultimately results in crazy high load and blowing up the queues for them, this is the team that feels it. And because our team's embedded in incident response, they're our primary source of leads. About 70% of all of our leads come from people on the front lines answering tickets saying, hey, this is interesting, I've never seen this before. So it pays to keep them happy. And next up is threat hunting, and threat hunting's moved around a lot at Meta. It's a fundamental capability of a lot of our different security teams, but we've recently crystallized it into its own dedicated function. And they plug into threat intelligence in a few ways. Primarily, we're there to help them prioritize the giant backlog of everything they could possibly hunt for, and narrow that down to these are the probable groups that are going to try to pop our company or have tried to pop our company in the past. So maybe prioritize the TTPs they use for threat hunting over something else. Where they plug in, Oops. sorry. Where they plug into TTP Forge is TTP Forge allows them to run a TTP and get signal of what that looks like when it detonates in our environment. For a lot of the things threat intelligence sends over to our hunters, we're lucky enough to have never experienced that type of attack in our environment. So we don't have the logs and the signal they need to know what that looks like in our environment to go and hunt it retroactively. All right, so detection engineering. You know, detection engineering is a very important partner. Ultimately, detection engineering is going to be amplifying our security by using high fidelity detections to accurately identify legitimate threats and ideally minimize false positives and negatives. Uh, Purple team, in collaboration with these folks, uh, we utilize a TTP forge to simulate varied threat scenarios and work to be able to empower the defenders to do this themselves. So for more simple TTPs, they don't even need to talk to us. They can just do it themselves, which uh, it's been going pretty well so far in terms of generating high quality signals for folks that don't necessarily have a strong offsec background. Um, now, Red Team, this is a real interesting one, especially when you think about plugging it in with threat intelligence. Uh, if you, threat intelligence as a team, their primary function is to research real world adversaries and threats. This knowledge can be incredibly, incredibly valuable for informing Red Team operations. So by integrating threat intelligence into the planning and execution of Red Team operations, we can gain a more focused lens through which we can examine particular threats. And this targeted approach allows us to anticipate and address potential threats with some answer to, can we detect this? Will we see this? Uh, and in turn, that uh, it leads to a lot of nice proactive and accurate uh, security wins. So that's pretty great. And uh, to maximize the effectiveness of red team operations, uh, Purple Team automates TTPs that are used in a red team operation uh, with the Forge. Uh, so in doing this, we're able to use the TTPs uh, either to control commits to trunk, uh, for infra deployments or to run them as needed to see if uh, a detection has regressed or stopped working. And so by closely examining the various paths that Red Team exploits, we can ensure a more secure and responsive approach to our security measures. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some of the difficulties that are unique to each of our teams. On the purple side, first and foremost, information overload. Um, it is vital for purple teams to prioritize quality over quantity when it comes to TTPs. If you're just running a bajillion TTPs simultaneously, I mean, that's almost as bad as the traditional model of just yeeting a pen test report over the fence and be like, yo, dog, fix this. Like, they have a queue. They have a lot of stuff going on. That's not going to help. Uh, so by just giving them a ton of signal, like, wh where are they going to start? Uh, so instead, we should aim for focused, in-depth exploration of fewer TTPs for more effective improvements. Let's focus on the outcomes. And next up, as I mentioned before, uh, purple teaming is a fairly nascent field. And so a lot of people think of it as pen testing. And I can tell you as a career pen tester, uh, very different. They're both quite important. Um, but with purple teaming, we are a lot more focused around trying to generate signal uh, that will be used to check and see, hey, does this work? Does this not work? Let's see if we can iterate. Uh, and ultimately, uh, by executing these in a controlled environment <laughs> and repeated uh, really as many times as needed to uh, ensure that we can improve our defenses or address any gaps. 
So on our side of the fence, the first step is ruthless prioritization. There are thousands of groups that we could track on any given, uh, any given day, and tracking is a super intensive procedure. Like it's costly for us to do. We don't want to track the entire world. And that's especially true in a world where every kid with a laptop can throw up a WordPress blog and call himself the next ransomware crew. And at the same time, like we don't want to drown our stakeholders as well. And it's a common trap of intelligence teams that they just pipe everything that they see to a downstream team in the hope that you care about something that lands. That problem gets compounded if you have vague intelligence requirements. Like contrary to popular belief, tell me what all the bad things are isn't a brilliant intelligence requirement for a team. So if you haven't told your team what you care about, what you care about, there's two things that will happen. One, your intelligence team's never going to send you anything and you don't see anything. Or they're going to throw everything at you in the hope that something sticks. And like that's become a massive industry trap for intelligence teams where we're perceived as just the producers of reports nobody reads. So that's one thing we've had to dig ourselves out of with really tight intelligence requirements. And the last is uncertainty and probability. So one of the taglines of my team is threat intelligence exists to remove uncertainty and to inject probability. And two, like sudden landscape changes, they're shrouded in uncertainty. We don't know who this group is, what they're capable of, if they've hit us, are we capable of defending against them? All of those are uncertainties that threat intelligence should exist to help teams remove and empower stakeholders to find the answers to those questions. But when we're doing that, we have a fundamental language gap. Intelligence works in a murky world of partial pictures, confidence ratings, TLPs, classifications, and probabilities that traditional blue teams don't use every day, every day. The blue teams that we deal with are much more absolute. They deal in true positives, false positives. Can we detect this? Can't we detect this? So that's where TTP Forges helped us bridge that translation gap. So it's not just me rocking up at your desk and telling you a spooky story about what's happening on the internet. We're, sorry. With, like, we're doing it from a point where there is this thing that poses a credible risk to our business, but we've tested it, and here's the data that proves it's a problem and we need to move now. And here is all the signal that arms you to take the next step. All right, so with that context and information in mind, why don't we talk about the shared problem spaces our teams have in common? <laughs> First and foremost, and I think this applies to, hey, I think this applies to anyone and, and everyone who does security in this room, how do we get people to care about this stuff? Uh, so on the purple side, uh, securing resources to address gaps can be a real bear. And so the key is effectively communicating the impacts of these gaps as far as the organization security posture goes. You don't want to just think about your little area that you're targeting. We are saying, in the grand scheme of things, what does this mean? <clears throat> and in doing that, we're able to highlight potential risks and repercussions if they are left, uh, these risks are left unaddressed. And that in turn allows us to advocate for the value added by remediating them. And so our advice is typically in the realm of utilize purple team reports, which are a joint report that everyone involved gets to contribute to, more on that later, and TTP Forge to support your case and convey the necessity for allocated resources. Uh, next up, time to test. Uh, as an internal consultancy, we prioritize tasks based on a well-structured priority queue, and no joke, it is a priority queue. Uh, that SANS talk covers that if you uh, find that interesting. <laughs> and uh, while our ability to define and defend our timelines is robust, our resources to automate TTPs are finite, and that can definitely pose some interesting challenges at times. Uh, lastly, uh, we work at Meta. That place has anything and everything you can possibly conceptualize. It is huge. And so uh, the nature of our diverse tech stack uh, can often lead to questions of, uh, hey, is this feasible to automate? Uh, and while we strive to automate as many TTPs as possible, uh, to, ideally to increase efficiency and, and provide defenders with a bigger picture on what's going on, the broad variety of tools and systems in use can present really unique challenges. What about on the uh, Intel side, bud? Yeah, on this side of the fence, the, like, the first one on getting people to care, the question we dread as a team coming back when we've brokered intelligence is, why should we care about this? Like, if that's the first question back to your intelligence team, your intelligence team has fundamentally failed in convincing you that you should move. And like, on time to test, like when we are dealing with landscape changes, we don't have the luxury of waiting weeks. Back to summer of 2022, that was in news articles now, so we need to do something about it now. And where we're trying to bridge that language gap between intelligence teams and more traditional security teams, we need to get that into test to generate the data that allows us to have the conversation about what the next step should be for the company. 
And the last piece on diverse tech stack to us, we're plugged into a fire hose of stuff and see different attacks and TTPs every single day. And that's compounded by, like as Jason says, Meta's huge. And we don't want to every day have to turn around to all of our different stakeholders, surface owners, tech owners, and say, hey, this happened on the internet. Does it work here? Like, is this viable here? We need a way to generate those answers ourselves. And then we come to you saying, we know it's a problem because we've proved it and we can limit that scope. So now we're going to delve into like bringing stories and reality together. So this is like what's happening under the hood between all these security teams when we're responding to a sudden change in threat landscape. So the easiest way to sum this up is intelligence teams are reverse engineering a playbook. And like, but like whether you like it or not, humans are lazy and playbooks exist. There's a talk later on today about the Conti playbook that leaked in 2021, where threat actors had a literally long form written playbook that they shared between operators of the Conti ransomware affiliate scheme. And like to the point where commands could be literally copied and pasted out and then were found in incident response reporting like months before those playbooks were actually released. On the flip side of that, there is like soft playbooks, the playbooks that exist in an adversary's head. And those are the TTPs that they use because they know they work. They've invested time in learning them, they've invested resources in building them and deploy them, and they'll use them until a point in time when they become inefficient or unvaluable to use. So we're stitching that playbook up from a, diff a number of different sources. And like the first is public incident reporting. And to the credit of like Coinbase, Twilio, Reddit that were responding to this group, their public incident reporting was brilliant. It had indicators, it had TTPs, it had everything we needed to latch on and start reverse engineering a playbook. But the reality of public incident disclosure isn't always like that. Often those things come heavily redacted by legal departments, so, so much so that the details lost and we can't reverse engineer a playbook. Next, we can plug into vendor intelligence. We're plugged into a load of different vendors. Um, but you have to be lucky that the group that you're tracking is big enough to be on your vendor's radar because they have multiple customers that it impacts. Because if it's not, it's likely that your vendors are also doing the same thing you're doing of trying to reverse engineer a playbook so they can sell you that intelligence before your team's capable of doing it. Then next, we plug into sharing communities. And this is everything from like incident response teams on the ground in different companies within our sectors that are like our eyes and ears of what's hitting us as a sector, or our threat intelligence sharing communities. And more recently, agencies like CISA have been a massive partner to us in proactively sharing things with us and working with us collaborati collaboratively to build up these playbooks. And last but not least, we build up, we plug all the other gaps with proprietary tracking. And it's hellishly expensive, but that's when we spin up our group to say, we'll do the, man the research manually ourselves to track, to build up the rest of the playbook. And that's the reason why that team spends most of our time tracking threats that only target Meta or only target a small cluster of companies within our sector that just aren't on anybody else's radar because nobody else is impacted. So that's where we spend a lot of our time. Then we stitch all that together from all those different sources into what we know about a group's playbook now. We'll plot that against MITRE ATT&CK, but a seven-step kill chain fits a hell of a lot better on a slide. So this is a really cut down and simpl simplified version. But when we're engaging Purple Team, there's two like choke points that we're looking for. One is high-frequency reuse TTPs. Those TTPs that we know an attacker is likely to try first before they fall back to something rarer in their arsenal. Um, the second in that, sorry. The second in that is like where we have good evidence from TTP Forge that we have existing detections for a certain step of an attacker's playbook. But there is one weird branch of their playbook where we have uncertainty. And we need to engage like Purple Team to go and plug that gap and work out, do we actually detect this in actual fact or do we not? Oops. All right, so uh, we have cultivated a phenomenal working relationship for over for over three years now, uh, and we have worked together across different time zones and geographic locations of the world. Um, and we didn't always have teams, uh, but I'll tell you, once we both got teams, uh, this uh, collaboration and phenomenal working relationship did not slow down. Rather, we've created vetted and scalable methodologies that facilitate doing cool work together. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we all want? All right, so you heard Adam's piece on the threat intelligence component here, so we're not going to uh, beat a dead horse, but we'll move on to the next step in this equation, purple teaming. So the first step to executing a joint operation with threat intel is automating the TTPs they brought to the table with TTP Forge. Again, automation provides scalability, uniformity in testing, 
and the means to replay these TTPs regularly to identify regressions or gaps. Uh, however, it's not always prudent to automate everything. Uh, there are some elements in an adversarial simulation that require more organic exploration of a target so you can actually get a sense for some of the pivot points that may come up. So next up, we plug something into TTP Forge and Purple Team help, helps us replicate it. If we have a detection that fires, great. A detection lands in a production queue and we know we have coverage. But TTP Forge allows us to add regression testing after that. So if in the future our detections regress, maybe somebody like disables a rule or our EDR rule engine changes, we'll know about it and can kick off a process to address that gap. But more importantly, if we, did, if we find that we have no detections, no alert fires, no incident response team is spun up in, in response to it, we have a gap and we have uncertainty. We know there is a TTP in the wild that an attacker is using that's like a risk to our business. And we engage threat hunting there to go and work out if that TTP has ever been used historically. And like true positive, they find something great. We can, well, not great, but we can escalate that to incident response to remediate. But there's equal value in them doing that sweep and proving the negative. And I see so many threat hunting teams optimizing for finding true positives and neglecting the value they bring in proving that the fleet is in a secure state as detection engineering works to plug a gap. Next up, we plug like detection engineering in. And the advantage of both these teams working with TTP Forge is they're working with a signal of what that attack looks like in their environment, in their logs, in their like full security stack. So they know what to hunt for on the hunter side and the detection engineering side, what to write a detection for. At the same time, TTP Forge allows them to replay an attack as they're developing a detection. So they know once it lands, it actually detects the TTP that it was intended to. After that, like we go through a whole process of IR onboarding. We don't just eat new detections into our incident response team and hope, hope they're good. There's a whole amount of playbooks, response flows, automation and metrics that have to be stitched to make sure the quality of life for our incident response teams is good. And that when that alert fires, if it ever does, they know how to respond to it, know the risks associated with it, and know what the next steps are. All right, the most important part, the report. Specifically, we tend to do joint reporting uh, for all Purple Team engagements. And through collaborating on a joint report, uh, we're able to create something that's a lot more effective and robust. Um, the combined effort of all of the different parties involved leads to an output that's stronger than any of its individual parts, uh, showcasing the practical value of working together. What a concept, right? Uh, and so this tends to be a much easier report for leadership to stomach. Um, it tends to be focused on actionable metrics and viable resolutions to longstanding issues. And each report aims to capture enough information so that other engineering teams are able to pick up that report and repeat the exercise, ideally without the original participants. That is a very important part of how we can scale, again, at a massive company. And so, uh, in the spirit of trying to provide the tools necessary for defense teams, engineering teams to repeat the work that we've done, we are also releasing Forge Armory, uh, which is a collection of commodity TTPs. Uh, some of these uh, are uh, even include detections, actually. I've been learning how to write some detections. It's been a good learning experience. Um, Red Teamers, you should definitely try that sometime. That, uh, it gives you a new perspective. Um, but yeah, so. With these detections, you can take those commodity TTPs and provide actionable information for your blue team. Or better yet, write them a well-documented TTP that they can run as many times as they want as they go through the process of trying to build a high fidelity detection or a prevention. And then you can move on to the other shenanigans that are in your backlog. And so uh, with respect to both the Forge and uh, Armory, uh, this is meant to be a community driven way that we can share information and allows us to better communicate and share processes between offsec and defenders that allow us to start fixing some stuff. Oh yeah, this is a good stuff right here. Uh, yeah, so we're going to launch into demos and like this is an example of like a cut down playbook that's quite traditional for us to throw at Purple Team and, and uses a mix of things that we're going to need their hacker expertise to come and manually replicate, but also a lot of things that they can throw into TTP Forge and automate for us. So yeah, kick the demo off. Yeah, sure. Let's go.
Um, so first up, like initial access, we were going to talk through Evil Engine X quite a lot here, but Chris Merkel did a 45-minute presentation yesterday about Evil Engine X. So if you're interested in diving into the realities of how to set that up, configure it, what the risks are and stuff, like check out his talk. It goes into way more depth here. But essentially, like I tasked Jason's team to go and spin up Evil Engine X for it, and he still hates me to this day. He hates me even more that I made him replay this um, for this demo because he had to do it twice. So to the point about automate what you can, definitely automate what you can. You'll never know when you need it in the conference talk. But to this, like we're going to run through it with an Outlook account because we've since patched this. But in summer 2022, we were halfway through our FIDO2 rollout. So we didn't know which surfaces had complete coverage of FIDO2, which users were enrolled and where it was viable. So when we first tested this, it worked and it blew straight through. You could like steal session tokens and authenticate to one of our accounts, which isn't great. <laughs> So, All right, uh, cool. So we're going to continue through the rest of this uh, demo. And so to start, uh, we got a credential and, uh, you know, we want to see what, uh, what's going on with that. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. Oh, yeah, sorry. This is the part where we're catching the credential from Evil, evil Nginx or Evil Genex. There we go. Hey, look at that credential. It's beautiful. Um, and I uh, forgot to show the uh, session, uh, so I went ahead and went back in so you all can enjoy that in all of its glory. And of course, I forgot the number. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's nice. All right, cool. So we have our initial access covered. Um, and this right here, oops. Hey, you want to talk about this? This is nice. What was it again? Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, sure. So when we ran this test, like, and Chris Merkel's got all this in his deck as well, of it, hunting this is really, really difficult because like one, you can say, okay, show me what the real authenticated logged in employee session looks like. And two, show me the evil engine X session. And like, you can do things like compare the geolocation, like the impossible travel style alerts. But when we did it, it generated 291 hits in 90 days because a lot of our employees are also using personal VPN to watch like YouTube and content in different regions. Great. So it's not something I'm going to just pipe directly into our incident response queue. In the end, we pared it down by saying the IP that authenticated, does it, does it feature in the A record of a young domain? Because what we were seeing were groups spinning up an Evil Engine X domain and then weaponizing it within 24 hours. So that was a really good way for us to pare that down. All right, we got a credential. So uh, we also have a sense for how we could detect that. Let's see if there's any goodies. And uh, all right, so logging in. Um, it looks like this uh, particular account is uh, not used for a whole lot. And by the way, you don't want to do that. You want to go ahead and just, we were never here. There we go. Uh, and hey, look at that. That looks real juicy. I bet that there is a lot we can do with that. Uh, so that's uh, the manual parts there. Now we're going to get into the forge. So first off, we're going to use the forge to execute a TTP that employs the enumerate IAM tool. Um, and so, I wanted to start by showing you all kind of what TTP looks like. Um, we, uh, we try to have some decent documentation around it so that ultimately defenders can read through and understand without having to get into the code. And beyond that, we also provide prerequisites, uh, examples that you can copy pasta like we're going to do here. And uh, we also have each step, which for defenders, these can be IOCs. If you're trying to figure out, hey, where do I start here? These are the steps that's gonna run. I think that there is some options here uh, in terms of doing that. And as I mentioned, we're trying to do some detection, so they ain't gonna be high fidelity. I am a, a red teamer playing a blue teamer on TV, but they give you a starting point for a conversation with your defenders. And uh, just a word of warning, um, the enumerate IM tool does not move as quickly as you're going to see here. It takes a lot longer, but I'm not going to uh, subject you all to that because that would not be a prudent way to spend our time. Uh, now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, we've got, looks like full access for admin, uh, SSM. We've got secrets manager. We can list secrets. We can describe instances. Uh, there's some good stuff here. We can access some logs. Um, so, hey, we, we've got some things we can work with, and this gives us a lot of attack paths that we can really start to think about in terms of, hey, what is an adversary going to do? Uh, now, here is another interesting thing. The detection uh, did not really catch much of anything, and so we discovered that uh, on certain API endpoints, uh, CloudTrail seems to be lagging, and subsequently, that's why we're not seeing anything here. 
So that's good to know as a defender. If you're like, hey, why am I not seeing this? Like, just give it a bit and then it'll show up. But all right, so we know roughly what we can do with this credential. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with Secrets Manager because that's always a juicy one. <coughs> and so this is a, another TTP. Uh, it basically allows you to pull a secret or multiple secrets or all of the secrets from Secrets Manager. So as you can see here, these are examples of how to use it. Those are the steps. And uh, hopefully those can provide uh, some viable IOCs for uh, defenders to start with. And so we'll go ahead and kick this bad boy off. And if we can take a look here, while we were able to get the secret, which is awesome, we also see that defenders can see that we were doing that. So uh, that means we have limited time uh, and we need to move quickly uh, if we were an actual adversary. Uh, so this is good. We have something here. We can work with this. Defenders can start to think about this. So, all right, we got a, we got a secret. We love secrets. Uh, this particular one is a database credential, and uh, we all know that that can be a lot of fun. So, uh, and if you're familiar with AWS, uh, so RDS is a relational database service, uh, and um, it's used to spin up uh, relational databases in AWS. It can be Postgres, can be MySQL, what have you. Um, now, we have this credential, and so one way we could do about this is just connecting to it and seeing what's up. But that's not what an attacker is going to do because that is going to look funky and probably is going to get you caught. So instead, we can just be a little patient. We have the means to describe instances. Let's see if there is anything that might be used to connect to this database regularly. So then we actually blend in, which we're trying to do adversary simulations. A good adversary is going to do that. And uh, so we've been uh, building up our uh, fleet of uh, Mac TTPs, uh, thanks to, again, Cedric Owens. Uh, this man knows a lot about breaking stuff in the Mac world. Uh, so here, we're just going to be good attackers and establish some persistence, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware. SSH is uh, quite often uh, just kind of open to the whole world. So doesn't seem like a far throw to just be able to throw a public key in in order to get back in, yeah? I've done it, it works. Um, and with launch daemon, I mean, defenders don't tend to look there because uh, there's just not a lot of great tooling around macOS. So, uh, hey, defenders, you should definitely look for uh, persistence mechanisms with that. And all right, cool. Now that we're on disk or we're on a system that uh, looks promising, it's a macOS system, uh, why don't we go ahead and run lasagna and see if there are any secrets in, the, uh, in memory or on disk. As you can see here, it didn't really find anything. And so this puts us in an interesting position as Purple Team. On one hand, we ran the TTPs, we generated the signal, job done. Not necessarily. We're again trying to simulate what an adversary does. So why don't we do a little bit of just organic exploration and see what we can do with that? Because once again, that is what an attacker is going to do. They're not just going to stop and say, oh, it didn't find anything. All right, cool, done. So. We're going to just use a find command, and uh, real quick, we got, uh, we got something that looks pretty good. And I'll tell you, if that matches the secret that we found in AWS Secrets Manager, I think we're in business. Ooh-wee, looks like it does. So now we know that we can connect to this database, and it's expected because obviously they're doing it on the system, and so we can blend in. All right, what we're going to do now is we're going to set up a listener on our attacker so that we can uh, shoot ourselves uh, some delicious data and uh, uh, simulate the uh, XFIL part. So uh, that's a nice little Docker container if you just need something on 8080 that echoes out whatever it comes in. And now we are on the macOS system connecting to the database. We'll just do a little bit of kind of recon, understand where we're at. We got a database that looks pretty juicy and uh, see if there's any tables that have anything that looks good. Oh yeah, that looks real good. <laughs> so uh, let's see what we get in users. We got password hashes, we got social security numbers. This looks like something that we want to steal to see if our defenders can catch it, yeah? So what we're going to do is uh, dump the database, uh, ideally in a directory that we have write permissions, like home yeah, that's nice. Cool. So we've got the dump. We've got the listener on the attacker box. We want to make sure the dump is for real. Looks like it is. 
So now we're just going to go ahead and send that over and uh, let's go ahead and grab this so it's easier to show you all what's up. Uh, it's base 64 encoded. So this is what it looks like on the attacker side. Um, you can do a little parsing there um, if you don't want to have to copy and paste the whole thing, but you know, up to you. Uh, so that's the massive string and uh, we're going to yeah, decode it. Boom. Success. We have stolen things and now we have a complete attack chain that we were able to automate. A lot of it we can repeat as many times as we need so defenders can drill on this and make sure that we have answers for these things. Okie dokie. Where's my mouse? There you are. Sneaky little devil. All right, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed making that. Um, I wanted to uh, impart a few takeaways from today's talk. Takeaway number one, we are releasing the T2P Forge, our framework that we employ for purple teaming, detection engineering, and a whole lot more. Uh, this is a project that we've been building for years uh, that has been a critical component of every purple team engagement at Meta. It's fine-tuned and built in a way that supports defenders with very little to no offensive background to be able to create signal and build offensive capabilities uh, that they can use while they're testing. It's phenomenal. Uh, it also supports chained executions for more advanced simulation, so you can do a fair bit with it. Uh, additionally, this is being released with Forge Armory, which is, again, a collection of commodity TTPs for a variety of targets. Now, if you look in the existing space, there's a lot of Windows, 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 Windows. And uh, you know what? There's plenty of tools that are able to solve that problem quite well. Not saying we won't support Windows, but our primary focus on our TTPs has been around Linux, Cloud, and Mac OS, uh, which is a sizable gap, uh, again, with a lot of the existing AdSim solutions. So I also believe that I've mentioned this once or twice, but uh, Cedric Owens is the uh, Purple Team co-lead, and that guy knows a lot about Attack and Mac OS, so we've got some good stuff in there. Uh, and to reiterate from before, uh, we really sincerely want this to be a community-driven effort, so come say what's up, let's chat, and uh, drink a beer or something. Uh, any thoughts, Adam? Yeah, and this last one's more of a personal note from me, but if you're in an offensive security team and you've never chatted to a threat intel person before, like, and you've got a threat intelligence team, go and chat to them. At the same time, if you're a threat intelligence person that's never worked with an offensive security team, you should be like opening that relationship up as well from the other side. When me and Jason first sat down three years ago and started to lay out the different problems our team had, it was amazing how much we shared in common. And now we've got a joint product and a joint process. We're much more valuable like, together than we ever were apart. So yeah, go and chat to each other, basically. Definitely, 100% do that. Um, and while it's just the two of us up here, uh, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We both have exceptional teams, and we want to make sure to pay respect to everyone that's helped to make this possible. So without further ado, here is the rest of the team after we both did an escape room. And as you can see, the glory goes to the top team uh, that uh, was able to finish it first. A uh, bunch of good looking folks in that one. And uh, there's also a lot of the names of folks who are not pictured, and they were, again, a massive help in doing this. So shout out to all these folks. And uh, I'll tell you, if any of this sounds cool or you want to get involved with doing this kind of stuff, we are hiring, red team's hiring, and blue team's hiring. Y'all should uh, throw your hat in the, uh, yeah, throw your name in the hat and let's see what shakes. Um, and with that, we'll take uh, any questions or whatever you have. Thank you, great talk. Uh, so one of the points you mentioned is prioritization. You know, roughly prioritize basically your efforts. So uh, can you maybe share, uh, you know, your thoughts about how to prioritize among different, you know, attacking techniques that you want to protect from? And also on the, on the environment side, you know, the, the environment is massive. So probably like tens of thousands of microservices. So how do you prioritize on, on that side as well? Yeah, great question. So uh, the question was around how we prioritize uh, effectively uh, around TTPs and uh, various surfaces that we need to secure. Um, by actually talking with our blue team and planning with them and trying to just really sit down and have some come to Jesus talks around, hey, 
these are things that we should really be thinking about. That's very helpful. Uh, we also have a bunch of teams that are in charge of different uh, surfaces, if you will, at the company. And so they really are in charge of prioritizing. For us, we just kind of try to jump in and try to do as much as we can in a certain area. W once again, as an internal consultancy, that gives us some flexibility. Um, so we can also uh, look at areas that maybe aren't getting as much love that really should. Um, but effectively a lot of communication and a lot of understanding what Blue is seeing and where their priorities lay and seeing where there is overlap. Anything to add on that? On the threat intelligence side, I think if you asked us that question, we'd prioritize it in terms of the groups that we track. So the highest priority for us is groups that have attempted to pop us in the last 18 months. They're like our highest, we'll track them with the highest frequency and the deepest detail. This, like the medium stuff for us is groups that have attempted to pop companies in the sectors in which we operate, but haven't necessarily, we've not seen them target us, but it's viable and it's probable we could become a risk. And then there's the rest of the world of stuff that's just interesting and out there that could be adopted. So that would be the spectrum that we kind of use. And like as an Intel team, it's not just what we've, what's published about a specific group. We have a lot of internal TTP data as well that can feed into that. So it's not just what's been seen by Blue Team when an attack's been thrown at us to go and replicate. It can be what we've seen from research of this act has done in the wild. Hopefully that helped. Awesome, thumbs up. Anyone else? Cool. Hey, y'all have been, oh yeah, go for it, man. Hey, Kyle. Hey, dude, you look awesome. Thank you. It's been so you long. Too. So, uh, what's an example of a low versus high fidelity TTP? And then, <clears throat> oh yeah, so uh, that that goes around the uh, detection, typically uh, with the terminology anyway. But um, uh, basically, uh, actually, you know what? You're the blue team, Mercy. So you should be answering this. Thanks for throwing me under the bus with that. I love you. <laughs> No, like, and you're probably going to jump in and correct me when I absolutely butcher this. But like in the past, it, like we've pushed, said this actor uses this TTP, go and deploy it as a detection. And things like our clone, are like top of mind when you say when we talk about fidelity, our clones used a lot in our environment. So as an Intel team, we're like. Our only perspective is we see attackers using our clone to exfil data. When we go to Blue Team and try and land that as a detection, it blows up 3,000 times a day because everybody's our cloning stuff all over the place. And we have no security policy in place that forbids you our cloning thing because it's a tool we use. So that's where the fidelity conversation comes down on my mind. It doesn't mean it's not useful for threat hunters and useful signal to see what our clone looks like in our, our environment, but it's probably not something that we're going to push for as a detection, at least a detection that's going to fire first. It might be a lookup that we do after an initial detection when we detect specific suspicious activity on a box. Yeah, so on one hand you can say, all right, like, hey, when this tool fires, it's bad. But then your defender's like, dude, what the hell am I going to do with all this? It's like a bajillion alerts. So uh, you can kind of look at that and say, all right, what kind of context happens around this so that we can maybe make this a bit more robust and not inundate our defenders with a bunch of BS? And so in trying to figure out more nuanced ways to look at certain behaviors that could be indicative of a threat, um, that is where the kind of high versus low fidelity piece comes in. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. cool. Uh, another question. Yeah, hit me. Uh, do you ever work, um, do, you, do you ever generate TTPs off novel vulnerabilities found internally that aren't coming from the wild, like from application security or product security or something like that? All the time, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, before I was here, I was um, with Kyle on uh, the ProdSec team at Splunk. Um, <clears throat> so I have a pretty decent web background and uh, we do a lot of uh, engagements with uh, products, uh, you know, IG, uh, FB, what have you. Um, and those obviously are going to look different than these uh, infra engagements to a degree. Uh, but we also have a really great relationship with our bug bounty crew. Um, and so we're able to take stuff that comes in from our exceptional bug bounty hunters and uh, also be able to incorporate that so we can have a lot of flows for different things that are of top of mind and maybe uh, are not as easy. But hey, you got some of the top bug bounty hunters in the world show, you know, throwing some pretty gnarly stuff over. Yeah, we're definitely going to take advantage of that. Absolutely. Will those come out in uh, on Armory with the uh, disclosure? Uh, so yeah, basically with Armory, we have to keep it commodity. That was kind of the dealio. So uh, we're not going to be uh, releasing, um, hey, here's how you abuse X or Y or Z. But that's a good question. OK, cool. Thank you. Thanks, man. Hey. Hey, good morning. Stop. 
Oh, cool. Never mind. Go ahead. Morning. Great talk. Thanks, uh, man. Thanks for sharing the tool. For so, sure. Looks amazing. Uh, something that came to mind is a different tool called Vector. Yeah. Is there any in the project's direction or is there any feature already that brings in that project management uh, aspect of it? I see. Sure. Yes, we are going to be using Vector. Um, I figured out how to make it, uh, I figured out how to turn it into Kubernetes manifests. Um, so uh, we're hopefully going to be contributing that uh, back to the community. Um, but yes, we do use Vector and poor Cedric has had to do some real serious stuff to be able to get that all landed. Um, but yeah, we do, and it's really cool. Um, the folks uh, that, that uh, are in charge of it are very nice. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, there's going to be some sort of integration between Vector and TDP Forge rather than uh, you know site-to-site -site comparison. Yeah, so the way that we're thinking about integrations with EDRs, with um, different tools like that, is we want this engine to be mean and lean. So what we're going to do is uh, effectively the concept of modules. So you can have bolt-ons that will provide you with the new YAML syntax based on the logic that you have in your module. Import that, use it. Not everyone's using Vector, so the folks that want to use it, cool, you got a module. Folks that don't want to use it, cool. It's not going to bog you down or make our tool any slower. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, man, for sure. And uh, hey, y'all have been awesome. Thank you so much for hanging out. We really appreciate it. The Forge. After this talk, I'm going to be uh, just doing the uh, dotting the I's and the T's. So uh, keep an eye out on those links that we uh, threw up. And uh, I hope you all find it useful. Hit us up. We want to talk to you. Let's drink some beers. Life is good. Cheers.